should eat as well. Like, <laughs> as I'm walking out of the restaurant, and I'm in a white shirt, as I said, completely covered in red <laughs> and I have first degree burns on my face. And she goes, how was your evening? How do you think it went? <laughs> Look at me. Look at me. <laughs> Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to episode 16 of Couples Quarantine. I'm James Haskell. And I'm Chloe Maidley. And today we have a very special guest. Uh, I'd like to say we're friends. Uh, <laughs> he might have something different to say about that. Um, he is a comedian, a world-class comedian, an actor, all-round dreamboat, sort of written as a ladies' man as well, which I don't understand how. But ladies and gentlemen, Jack Whitehall. Hello, how are you? <laughs> That was such Good. a timid. You're like, yes. at what point do you think, you shit, nervous, I shouldn't Jack. have agreed to do this? You're wearing shorts. Yeah, yeah, he came straight from training. Yeah, straight from training. Well, so you're very backlit. A man of your stature can't be backlit because if you tense, you'll suddenly be a silhouette. Yeah, I quite like that, though, with the wings. I've just, I'm actually, I'm slimming down these days. I've got more of a focus. I'm going for more of a holistic approach, mobility focus, really. Because uh, I got. Why a- do you look brown? Do I? Yeah, you've got like a no, nice. I think if I come golden... close to the camera, you'll see it. <laughs> oh, oh, ghost. Yeah, no, Christ. Yeah, ghostly. ghostly sure. Yeah. It's also <laughs> that one. slight, like, lockdown red tinge that one gets after drinking daily. <laughs> Yeah, right. uh, I mean, this is what I'm struggling with, not turning into a raging alcoholic, which actually brings us nicely onto the first question. How are you finding lockdown 2.0? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm good. The restaurant that I live above is now doing uh, takeout. So it's become uh, a slow process to see what I can get away with in terms of getting you can just get. literally do room service, basically. Uh, I love that. I'm surprised a man of your stature lives above, above a restaurant, or are you being polite and it's like a well, mission yeah. style restaurant in a castle? It's not a kebab shop. It's a, it's a very high-end Notting Hill brunch spot for yummy uh, mummy. No, of oh, course excellent, it is. excellent. Oh, excellent. Glu- one, because I don't want people turning up outside my house. Yes, don't, 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 we don't want to mention that yet. There are a lot of brunch spots in Notting Hill, so it could be any of them. But yes, like, but you did sort of narrow it down to Notting Hill. I wouldn't have gone that far as, as we've had our fair share of stalkers up here in Northamptonshire. So, um, oh my god, they just show up at the door, and James doesn't care. James is like, oh, it's fine, don't worry. And I'm sat there with my panic button, like rocking back and forth every time he's not in the um, house. So, well, so I, I don't get them outside my house because I'm very careful. I never let my house be seen on camera. It's never yeah. any of my shows. My parents' house, on the other hand, is always in them. It's in all of our Netflix shows. It's in our BBC show. It's in sketches. It's always on camera. And it's a very distinguishable house right down by the river. So everyone knows where they live. There's loads of people outside. And my dad, whenever he goes outside the house now, there's always people kind of waiting for him, normally asking him to tell them to fuck off because that's yeah. the phrase now. And they want him to say fuck off, which he's very willing to oblige. How does yeah? But I can imagine because you know I haven't had the privilege of meeting your dad. He he's someone that I no, fuck off. I imagine if if you wanted him to. Yes, well, yes. <laughs> I mean, I kind of like to have a proper conversation him with him, but I just sort of more. It's more the fact that I can imagine he's not a man that likes to be sort of put upon like that. I don't imagine. I imagine you want a formal appointment with someone like that. Well, he sort of claims he doesn't. He claims he doesn't like the fact that he has this sort of. Um, later life celebrity but i think secretly deep down he quite likes it um and he's also insulated because i i think one of the major flaws with being um you know like a comedian like me i set myself up for it because my persona on screen is a sort of jolly idiot someone described me the other day as like i'm your your like your brother's mate or like your you know like I, i have that kind of energy when i'm on screen and people expect me to be like that all the time and uh so when people come up to me i sort of feel a little bit of an obligation that i should Mm. be upbeat and friendly and nice and i have to maintain that persona even if i'm having a bad day my dad his persona is miserable uh like a a miserable old git which is a great persona to have because then when you are a miserable old git which he is maybe you know half the time and people come up to him they're never disappointed because they're like oh my god he's in character that's exactly what he's like that's how he is on screen and that's how he is in real life. And I've just really, I've made a rod for my own back. You have but made it, a rod for your own back. Yeah. Do you, do you find that quite hard though? Because I, you know, we sort of had that weird, uh, like I've been a fan of yours for a long time. I love your, your your acting stuff, you know, bad education and all the kind of things you've done. You've obviously had, you know, huge success. And, and we sort of had a meeting across kind of social media where you, you sort of don't really get to know someone. You're both playing sort of a, a persona. But every time I met you, obviously you're, 
you know, you're always sort of very engaging, but you're quite, you know, you're quite reserved and quiet. I don't know what I thought I was going to, whereas, you know, was going to get you were sort of, I don't know, be bouncing off the walls. Do you find it hard sometimes to have to, to be like that all the time? Because I, I go the other way where people come up to me and go, right, lad, 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 we're right. And I'm like, are you fucking yeah. all right? Like, I don't walk around talking like that all the time. Hmm. No. Well, I think, yeah, there is definitely a thing with comedians where you have to be always on. Um, and I've also, you know, I, I know because... I remember meeting comedians that I looked up to and I loved and, and when I met them and they weren't like they were on TV or in the movies. Yeah. It's really disappointing. And, you, and you've had that experience. You've been let down and I won't name names, but there are definitely comedians that I've met. I was like, oh God, I was really expecting you to be a little bit more kind of life and soul. No, but so, you, you're yeah. different though. So, so what I was going to say is, is you're, out of all the people I've met, and I've had that before with certain people in the public eye where I, I've met them, you know, I bizarrely have got invited to these places. I'm always a bit like a stick out like a like a sore thumb. And Chloe, you know, because of what her parents did, she sort of been through that, done it, realised that that kind of all turning up to parties wasn't her kind of kind of thing. Um, and I've been bitterly disappointed. But actually with you, you, you're like a very normal, nice person. Whereas a lot of some comedians and stuff, people I've met are like quite odd like awkwardly socially odd. Yeah, I don't look I you in the male face. Male comedians, and I'm sure Jack, you'll know this very well. Male comedians do tend to have a history of being fucking brilliant on stage and like the life and soul, exactly what you said. But actually, when they're off, they're actually normally quite shy or even like depressive, uh, like introverted types, and their time to shine is, is is on stage. I think you are one of the quote unquote more normal ones. I have to say. <laughs> Well, I th yeah, there is the, the, the kind of like the sad clown, which is a trope, and it does definitely exist. I think there are people that, you know, are, are very much playing a persona, and when you meet them in real life, there's a big detachment to the person that you see when they're on screen or up on stage. Yeah. And I try not to be that, and I try to, you know, you know be, a, you know, the best version of myself when people, um, I meet people. Although sometimes I do think I just need to get better at kind of, you know, Spotting Being in the loony. public eye. Yeah, 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 yeah. I spot the loonies like straight away. Oh, I'm, I'm, like, bad. I'm like, yeah, I'm loony bay in a in a in a pub. I, I actually had. I'll tell you a story about a date that went very badly because I was in uh, like a gastro pub near me, as if there's any other type of pub. Near me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you are literally in middle class city. Like, I don't know why we're pretending that you're street or urban. Yeah, um, and I was, uh, I was, I was having sort of some food with this girl and uh this guy came up to me in a west ham shirt and like um had overalls on his bottom half covered in paint and a cap uh, he looked a little bit eccentric or and he was quite lit like he came over and i could smell quite a lot of alcohol on his breath anyway he went i'm james corden's cousin and you know, he, he sounded like he could maybe be from James's neck of the woods. He was wearing the West Ham shirt, and James is a West Ham fan. Like he didn't look a million miles away from James, and I know James pretty well. I don't know all of his extended family, so I was like, it's legit that this could be his cousin. <laughs> but I started talking to him. He seemed to know quite a lot about James. He, I think he mentioned where James was from, which is like Wickham. So I was like, okay, Aww. this is probably one of his cousins. Maybe this sounds legit. Sounds legit. Yeah, I should be nice to him. So I carried on talking to him. He at that point sat down. So then the date had become like a three-way situation, him with his beer, which was pretty full at the time. So I was like, I think we might have him for the whole of this drink. And I was looking at the girls, I'm so sorry, but I work with James, you know, and obviously like, I can't, you know, be rude to one of his family because they can get back to James and that was not a good look. So then we carried on talking. And I, I, honestly, he was there for like 20, 25 minutes. And about 25 minutes into the conversation, he dropped that he was also Jamie Redknapp's cousin. I was like, oh no, oh, I've messed no. this up. I fucked it. Oh, I messed this up. But then how do you get rid of them when they sit down like that? Like, what do you do? You're like, okay, you have to leave now. Uh, yeah, but that, again, I'm not, I, I'm, I'm incapable of doing that. Yeah, but of course yeah, but you are, because you're a nice I realized guy. That it was complete fantasist, and he was not related to Jamie and James, because then that would mean James and Jamie were related. <laughs> I, I still couldn't tell him, uh, you need to leave because I'm having dinner and you're not invited to this. I just got up and just like, I think I just left. He went to the toilet and I just left and went to another pub and then was like hiding in case he came past. Oh my that, God. I actually think that's a good strategy to get out there because uh, I I agree. You can't just ask. James's fans do this all the time, rugby fans. They come and sit down at our table when we're having dinner or lunch. And I'm like, yeah. what the fuck? Like, how entitled is that? But James is obviously a really nice guy. So he'll talk to them about it. And But it's always the weird part is like getting 
out of it. We had it happen recently with a very famous actor, friend of ours, who we know. And these two women just came and sat down while we were all having dinner and wouldn't leave. And I could see he was, I thought he knew them. So I wasn't saying anything because I'm savage. I would have been like, bitch, you need to leave. But like, didn't say anything, kept my mouth shut. And then suddenly it materialized that they didn't even know him. And thank God one of his mates showed up and then was like, you two need to go now. And I was like, oh, fuck. Yeah, it, but we've had that before. We went to STK, you know, in um, below the, the media hotel right for a for a steak we did some they were doing some whiskey food night and we will talk about your your food slut thing in a bit and yeah. um we went there and basically this guy's come over and he's like oh james haskell you're like yeah and he's like oh and he's like how are you i loved you playing for ring i was like yeah thanks so much mate he's like chloe yeah you know my wife's a big fan of yours yeah and then just sat down and was like you know budge up budge up and you're like <laughs> what and I, I but i'm like you i don't because you can't look like me and have a demeanour and sort of be like the Marmite. Like, you're sort of universally liked. I don't have that. I'm not afforded that same extension. So I, my part of me is like, after about five seconds going, oh my God, this guy's bedding in. Like, he ain't going anywhere. I don't know what to say. But I've got a Rottweiler over here that normally goes, will we'll step in and go, look, I think, yes, yeah, really nice of you, but actually we're, we're eating here. This is a date, you know, without, in a polite <laughs> way. I am a bigger fanny than, than anybody. Yeah, but my parents to made me their bodyguard when I was young. That's why they were like Chloe, and I was the one that had to de- deal with it always. They've tr- literally trained me to protect people like. You. <laughs> I, I want to know before we before we get on to stuff um, about the, the dating because I think that's a, it's a great story. How, how are you mentally fa- finding lockdown? Because obviously, as like a, a performer and not able to to, to be yeah. performing. How are you finding that mentally? You know what? I think I'm very fortunate because I was able to do a tour that finished just before we went into lockdown. So I think I'd very much, um, you know, exhausted that need to be on stage. Mm-hmm. And by the end of a tour, you just, you know, you're done. You're bored of the sound of your own voice. You hate all of your jokes. You never want to perform in front of an audience again. So I, I'm really lucky in that psychologically I had like I'd done my tour and I'd finished it. Um uh but in terms of like not being able to work and not being able to, you know, create and do things, I found that really hard because I, I don't think I've stopped like the last, you know, ten years. I, I you know, I'll I'll barely go on holiday for more than a week. I just love constantly working and, and it really has, you know, ground to a bit of a halt that you know that fear that everyone has of not knowing when normality yeah. will return has been a weird thing to adjust to i mean obviously now we've in a second lockdown i feel like i'm a little bit more kind of prepared for it um and have managed to find some other things to kind of occupy my time but certainly that first lockdown it was it was a real leveler for everyone because everyone was in the same boat everyone was like what is happening what do we do when is it going to end um, and at least this time around, I think people are maybe mentally a little bit more prepared for it. So, so reading between the lines, essentially finishing a global tour, it, you know, there's a bit of money in the bank to keep the wall from the door. So you're sort of sitting above your Michelin-starred restaurant, getting food delivered, <laughs> relaxing, probably laying on some sort of chaise long, I imagine. Bring out the tiny violins, just <laughs> No, oh yeah. That's what I mean. But I wonder if you're are you in like full creative mode at the moment? Are you because a lot of people I spoke to, I, I interviewed a couple of musicians, and Chloe and I have talked to different people, and this lockdown, bizarrely, and even the lockdown too, has kind of allowed people to go into different avenues that they wouldn't ordinarily have have sort of gone down. And I wondered how you'd sort of you know whether you're kind of diversifying or doing anything that you wouldn't normally have done or had a chance to do. I mean, well, obviously the temptation is just to rattle out as many podcasts as you can, but yeah. I was just like, I need to be careful not to spread oneself too thin. I'm yeah. so, oi, very this fucking funny. I'm so have. thin, you can't even see me. I've like spread so, myself. <laughs> I'm the thinnest person known to man. Podcast kid, the podcast kid. Proper. Hey, it's because I can't podcast do anything. Slut. How many books is he going to string that out to as well? <laughs> I reckon what a well, is going to be, yeah, part one with the five yeah. parts. Oh, it's going to be a five-parter, isn't it? Can I, I, I need to, I'll send, um, I'll, I'll send a copy to all the brunch spots in Notting Hill, uh, hoping to find your, your house with an address. There's going to be a lot of books. <laughs> I think you quite enjoy it. I think you quite enjoy it. <laughs> Given that this is couples quarantine and obviously we're not going to push you to talk about your personal life because that's not who we are or what we're here for, but are you locked down in with your missus or are you separate? Yeah, no, no, yeah, we're locked down in. We locked down in the first one together. And um, this one. We're locking, locking down in this one together. And how are you finding it on your relationship? Are you completely fine? Are you like having a bit of a kind of mm, panic with it? Because I know we've had our ups and downs. You've had <laughs> lovely weeks and then we've had horrific weeks. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, I mean, initially, I'd only, we'd only been dating for 
a kind of couple of weeks. Um, Shut <laughs> up! Oh. Really? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, we no, no, I mean, a bit, a bit longer. But like the actual time that we'd spent together, it was you know, and then we were into lockdown. Um, yeah. So, but weirdly, that was it was quite nice because it was a chance to just like spend a lot of time uh, with each other and you know accelerate through a relationship in a way. Um, yeah. But then when lockdown ended, we realised there's a lot of things we you know never been to see a film together. You know, had only oh, been out, like never that. been out to like a restaurant in England because we'd met in Australia. Um, so we had to do a lot of the stuff that you would normally have done at the beginning of a relationship. I like. So that. you almost got kind of like some of the some of the groundwork bits of like, what's it like to live together? What's, you know, irritating habits, putting each other in sort of our certain space. And then afterwards, you're like, once you realise you're actually on, you then get to do some of the fun stuff and that pressure's <laughs> almost off. It's like reverse, reverse dating. Reverse dating. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, I, I also feel like uh, I, I, I strive to be a better influence lifestyle-wise as well, because I think she, you know, wants to lead a healthy lifestyle. Oh yeah, She's pescatarian likes her exercise, all of those things, and maybe I can be a little uh, lax. You sound like she's got you like at gunpoint, like it's like pained. I thought you were going to no, say like you- I'm like a feeder. I'm terrible. You That's know, what like, I mean. No. So what she's serving up fish? I did, and twice. I did Pilates twice on a on a Zoom situation. Oh well, calm How down. Is that? You completed. You complete. How did you find Pilates? I'm so twice bad at it. Gig. Um, yeah, completed it. <laughs> what, I'm, what, what I'm wondering now is that without you know dishing dirt because we don't you know we don't the Daily Mail on 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 the, on the line even though they do me and Chloe over every day is if <laughs> is if your missus is sort of a a fitness and health freak are you sort of towing towing the party line to her face and as soon as she's out the door you're like onto Giuseppe Pringles. to deliver deliver things out you're having a tab out the window you're like <laughs> drinking she's coming in like what's that and you're like it's a protein shake and you've been topping it up with vodka <laughs> no I mean it I think it just doesn't help that I, I've also ended up doing this like food thing which food is also yeah. just the worst food you could possibly eat and it's all just indulgence um, but wait talk to me about food I, about how it came about and what, how it's going because i'm really upset i didn't get to come i know food slot is like um it's all those kind of like decadent dishes that cheat day meals okay yeah. which is and that's how i justified it to myself i was like look if the rock can have a cheat day then i can have a cheat day mm. Of course, what you then need to remember is that what The Rock's doing in between those two cheat days is probably yeah. slightly different to my lifestyle. And that's how a cheat day works. You can't have cheat day every day or else you're in serious trouble. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it, it really just started as like a kind of, you know, a sociable thing to do. I'm mates with a lot of people that like cooking. I've got friends that are chefs. Um, and then uh, we did it in lockdown as a bit of fun. Uh, to raise a bit of money for charity and then after lockdown did a pop-up restaurant and we'll probably try to do some more things with it going forward um just because it's you know it's fun it's it's a passion of mine it's something that i enjoy and um yeah it's all happened quite accidentally which i think is quite nice um yeah, it's always a good way zero pressure and if it you know I stop doing it tomorrow it'll be fine and i've got other things going on but it's just yeah. a nice yeah it, nice if passion. you um if you uh, were going to give people tips for sort of surviving lockdown, because that is quite an intense way of doing it, sort of dating for, say, a month or so and then going in it, what, what have you found is a secret to kind of surviving in, in lockdown in, a, in, a, in an early relationship? Because lots of people who listen to this, we originally started this podcast as you know, a sort of a guide to couples in and sort of dealing with some of the problems that they, they're finding in lockdown. What were your sort of stumbling blocks and how did you get about them? Because Chloe and I spent a lot of time in different parts of the house sort of having our own individual time yeah and then yeah. sort of merging well you know i mean you know me the advice i give will always be really relatable and i would say yeah having a bit of space there will be whole days where i will be in the east wing and she will be in the west wing and that will be fine We're stay right. out of the west wing <laughs> yeah. if you want to speak like i'll give the butler a little note pop it underneath the <laughs> send it over to her you know back and forth and it's just a really easy way to make sure that you're not treading on each other's toes. Do you remember? Do you remember Batman the movie with Michael Keaton, the very <laughs> first one, when they go on a date? He was really sexy. He in was that really movie. sexy, and they go on a date, and basically they're having dinner. It's the first date, and Alfred served the soup at one end of this massive table, and they they, they can't hear each other. I yeah. imagine that's at meal time. The reason you two get on so well is that you've never had a proper conversation because you <laughs> can't hear each other down the, 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 the twelve foot oak table. It's also very good COVID dating that as well. 
Yeah, so, <laughs> social distancing. Social distancing. Social distancing. <laughs> I love it though that like you're obviously she's obviously like a health nut and you're obviously not and I actually this again I don't know why I keep bringing up my mum and dad on this podcast it's odd but it's really interesting because my you're obviously a creative so my mum is very much like a writer she's very much uh, an intellectual um, but but in a, but in a creative uh, kind of capacity whereas my dad I think is much more kind of really into his fitness really into his health and they're actually they balance out like quite well I have to say but I mean other than the Pilates is she basically sorting your diet out for you or are you just food no, around as much as you want <laughs> I don't know I to be fair I'm not as bad as I let on and I do I think probably have both of those elements of me it, I am as it were 50% Richard 50% Judy <laughs> Me what too. a combination oh my God, myself and that. Like, I am the, <laughs> like, that's, a lot of people say that to me you know this as well can we talk about this we must have spoken about this before you know when I first went on TV everyone thought that I was Richard and Judy's son oh because you because you're called Jack and you look a little bit Jack. like my brother yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah. when I first did Big Brother's Big Mouth everyone just assumed that I was Richard and Judy's son and there was a lot of people on Twitter talking about me as Richard and Judy's son so I've always felt an affinity to you because of that because I feel like I'm the brother you well you did have but <laughs> <laughs> as your I, I like, like I like her actual brother the... Jack but I'd like to be mates with you because you're mates with The Rock as well and yeah. The Rock's like, as you can imagine is like an idol for me He's like He's an idol. Episode... can I tell you the other thing that when I first went on television and did Big Brother that there were two rumours because back then I'd never done TV before and I remember going on afterwards and like finding the online forums and reading everything which was a terrible no. terrible mistake no, yeah. don't what do you that thinking? so Rich and Judy your mum and dad which is quite funny but then the other one was there was a whole forum with a massive thread underneath it which was does Jack Whitehall have a glass eye and someone had said that I had a glass eye and it looked like I had a glass eye when I was reading the auto cue. And I read it and I was like, that's so ridiculous. But it still managed to like embed itself in my head. Brain. It became a thing that I was then really conscious of. So then the next night I went out to do the show and I was like darting my eyes around. <laughs> He's saying glass. These are real, baby. <laughs> Never, ever, ever read those forums because they will fuck you up psychologically for the rest of your life. Like This is going to be something now that you're conscious of for the rest of your career. Does your brother have a glass eye? No. <laughs> My brother's like, it's a compliment actually because Jack is obviously called Jack, but he's really, really good looking. And you guys actually do look quite similar. I think you're better spoken than him though. Jack's still got a bit of a mank accent on him. A little bit, yeah, but they're both good, good looking, good looking blokes. Yeah, you yeah, know, it's not an insult. Of, yeah, it's not an insult at all. I think you've done, you've done well there. Do you, do, have you, just on that subject, have you, uh, is that the worst thing you've gone and found about yourself? Or did you, did you, did that, did that, uh, satiate yourself enough to realise you shouldn't go and ever look at this shit or are you still like that where you go and click on something on the Daily Mail comments they're like he should fucking burn in hell he's not funny D hope he dies you're like Sharon from Nor Norwich you're like fucking hell Sharon take your foot off the gas yeah I'm quite I mean I'm quite thick skinned when it comes to some of that and some of it's quite funny look Twitter's the one where it's obviously just so savage I've done this um, AXA health campaign, which... I've seen it. I, I, I enjoyed it, yeah. It's fun and it's been, you know, really nicely received. And I put it out on Instagram and people really enjoyed the, you know, the ethos behind it, which is like feel good health and, and, and you know, trying to find fun, easy ways of like staying fit and, and, and mentally fit as well. Like it's a, it's a, it's a good like nature thing. <laughs> I went on Twitter and someone had put underneath the first one, which is me like making a green smoothie. Why doesn't Jack Whitehall put his head in this blender? That would be the funniest <laughs> thing I've ever done. And it was like this middle-aged man with kids and a picture of his dog on his profile. I was like, why are you so angry? I'm just asking people to stay fit and look after their mental health. Right, yeah. Twitter well, is... Well, obviously that guy's far past the point of help. I mean, this is why I came off Twitter. Fan, I was though. like, yeah. I mean, but I'm like, I was on Twitter. I'm not a journalist. I'm not a politician. And to be honest, I think that really those are the only two people that really benefit from having a Twitter account in terms of both their, their research and their, their audience. And I was just like every day getting trolled to fuck. So by the end of it, I was like, why am I on this? Came off. I swear to God, I never get shit on Instagram. Never. It's never just know. a Twitter thing. Why Twitter? It really is a Twitter thing. But you know, also I think you know, Facebook's headed that way as well. It's it's basically just it, I find it astounding that sort of middle aged, uh, especially on Facebook, middle aged sort of women and men very unhappy about lots of stuff. Twitter yeah. just a cesspool of negativity. But it's all it's just 
I've ne- it's so weird. It's like, because it used to confine that to kind of newspaper comment sections. Yeah. And now it's overflowed into real life. And I'm honestly astounded. And what upsets me is it, what they write doesn't doesn't hurt me. It's it's just the, like the pure stupidity. And it's like, they don't, they don't know what they think is like so important that they've got to share it. And it's like, actually nobody nobody cares you you're you're like what you've written is a real reflection on yourself but you're not bright enough to be aware of what you're how you're doing it and i i said i messaged chloe the other day i did something about this um i was driving around a tank in london for grenade uh, mm. promoting keeping the gyms open you know obviously uh i think they're good for mental health and whatever and um people are like fuck off mate you don't need the you know fucking gyms you know it's not first line you're spreading the disease it's like whoa, whoa <laughs> let's just take your foot off the gas do you know what i mean i don't yeah but so you've sort of learned that lesson instagram, early. Has, it, instagram has its faults but inherently it's a kind of sort of aspirational isn't it i mean obviously in a former to life before you you know with your gone of gorgeous partner oxy you were you've sort of been i don't know if you sit comfortably with you but labeled as a bit of a ladies man i mean is that mm-hmm. something you recognize or sit with or or you think is utter crap no i don't i, I mean I, I don't think so i think just because i'm in the public eye for some reason like if i fart it ends up in a newspaper yeah uh, and so i think just my problem is that i've talked about it on stage and I and it's part of what I do and it's subject matter that I that I that I use publicly so it's my own fault and I can't really complain because you can't have it one way and not have the other so but I uh, disagree with that I think if you're an artist in any way whether you're an actor or a comedian doing stand-up or even a singer-songwriter you know like a Taylor Swift whatever it, it you you'd be god awful at it if you couldn't draw on your own history and your own life experiences and basically get the audience you're a performer get the audience to connect with you that's your job you have to do that but i am not a big believer and again i know because i've grown up watching this happen i am not a big believer at all that that then means that fleet street and you know joe public are entitled to every single area of your life and your privacy like how would you ever be expected to survive mentally if you were just public fodder. Yeah. I mean, it's not fair. It's a complete... I think you've got it the right way around and I think you're handling it really, really, really well. You've obviously had two sides of kind of the, the story because you weren't always kind of known in the public eye. So I imagine how different was kind of dating pre-fame. So you've obviously told one sort of story in relation to someone coming to sit down. But what was it like in the old days, especially with sort of... You know, like your old man. Because when I was young, you know, you ha- obviously we didn't have mobile phones. So you had to sort of call up and say, you know, hello, it's James Haskell here. Can I speak to so-and-so? And you'd get this irate dad. be like, who? Who? And be like, Sarah, some fucking guy called Haskell's <laughs> on the phone. And she'd be like, okay, come in, dad. And you'd have this sort of awkward f- conversation. I mean, firstly, what was that like? And when you were living at home with your old with your old man sort of answer, were they, you know, do you have to hide it from them or they were, they were quite fun or were they were embarrassing? I'd say probably quite embarrassing. And he's quite a hard person for uh, any um, partner to me, definitely, and remains that. <laughs> uh, he can be very challenging. And and, and and deep down, I think that he kind of enjoys it. He enjoys how terrified he's making people. <laughs> um, and has certainly done that with a few of my sister's um, boyfriends and indeed her fiancé, who we put through the ringer until he kind of accepted him. Um, In like what way, though? What way? Like, like a meet the, the parents kind of Robert De Niro vibe. Somehow found out that... Uh, <laughs> I can't leave me. Uh, so I spoke. <laughs> this is, this is going to be good, yeah. Molly's husband uh, was maybe a bit of a Lothario before he met Molly. Which I think all good met. people are, mate. All good people are. All good people are. So then, like, that's all he talked about and loved, like, winding him up about how he used to be a shagger and, like, in front of Molly and in front of Toby. And then <laughs> we were like, just drop it. You just need to drop it. And he's just quite good at, like, winding up. Um, my brother, uh, Barney, when he was at um, school, I remember, got one of his first girlfriends and was very excited uh, and came back home and told uh, Michael, oh, we've got this girlfriend, uh, what's her name? And, and, and a great name. She's called Cecily Money Coots. And my dad went, Money Coots is in Coots the Bank. And Barney was like, uh, I don't know. Yeah, I guess so. It must be Coots the Bank. And then he looked it up and found out that her, she was like the Coots heir from the, the Queen's Shit. Bank. Shut and up. Like, just let it cool, Daddy. Just, just been, it's his first girlfriend. He's, you know, he's a little bit nervous about it. And Daddy was like, Barnaby, 
whatever you do, don't fuck this one up. <laughs> it's like he's thirteen. <laughs> he's thirteen. Thirteen years. But dads, old. but dads are all like that. My Your dad's, dad's my like dad's that. exactly like that. You know, I, 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 anyone with any sort of cash, come on, son. You know, think of the family. Think of them. Like, dad, it's not how it works. Like, I'm not going to settle. I'm not going to settle. Dowries anymore. Um, There's no dowries or arranged arranged marriages. I told a story once on a. I think I did it on Would I Lie to You, and, and no one believed me, but it was true. Uh, about uh, uh, one of the rare experiences where I, I took a girl back to my parents' house because I would seldom do that when I was living at home, aged kind of eighteen, nineteen, for fear of them having to meet my family. Uh, but I did on one occasion and we were upstairs in my bedroom and the following morning, my dad, as his want was back then, uh, like opened the door, came into my room in a dressing gown with a copy of the Daily Telegraph and uh, wanted to read me um, a an article about, uh, I think it was the Euro. That's how long it was ago back then. Even back then, he was angry about uh, the European Union. Uh, and he sat down and, and I had whipped the cover over her um, she was in bed l- lying asleep next to me and had like covered her in the duvet. But then he sat down in his dressing gown and started reading this article, which was the most long winded telegraph article, like a proper like double page, you know, center fold article on the euro. And and he it kept going on and on and on. I was like, she's going to suffocate. I'm literally I'm like, <laughs> oh, like trapped underneath this duvet at some point. She's going to have to come out for air. And so I just had to like reveal her to my father, at which point he just closed the newspaper, got off and left. Left the room. I'm so sorry, that was my dad in his dressing gown. My dad uh, once, when we, when I was living at home, again, we had a situation where there were some kids outside smoking and one of them chucked a cigarette into his garden and it was quite <gasps> late at night. So he was already in his dressing gown at the time, getting ready to have a bath. And I'd gone up and I'd said, Daddy, there's some people outside the house. He'd looked out the window, seen literally the moment that one of them threw the cigarette into his front garden, like saw the, you know, the cigarette butt land in his precious hydrangeas, completely flipped a gasket, like left the room, stormed downstairs, went out to confront these young guys, was shouting at them. And I then, you know, looked at them. They were kind of, you know, there was four or five of them, teenagers, like, what like I genuinely thought in that moment that my my dad was maybe about to be sparked out, and I was like <laughs> getting ready to have to call the ambulance and the police because Daddy was going to get assaulted. Um, and it was like fate intervened, like this gust of wind shot up his dressing gown because he'd gone down so quickly he hadn't fastened it properly. <laughs> he billowed open, billowed open, and these guys that were ready to square up and knock him out. I've never seen <laughs> one quicker, like bolting over. <laughs> running away from this elderly man that was exposing them and he was trying to get it back down as well couldn't like, get a proper purchase so it almost looked like he was like fanning it like an angry swan just to draw more attention to his neighbors. <laughs> running away from the late night tea but there's one part of that story there's one part of the story where you've gone which sort of sums you up is it's, it's daddy there's people at the front of the house. And like, I'd, I'd be like, dad, there's fucking some people at the front. I'll go down. Don't send my elderly, elderly father in a dressing down, dad. And you're like that. Daddy, daddy's gone down. You're hiding away behind the thing, <laughs> waiting to call the police on daddy. You're like, yeah, my daddy's been killed. How old are you, little fella? I'm 27. <laughs> I'm 27. Daddy's gone downstairs. I'm like, I'm like, your daddy's an elderly man. One punch, your dad'll uh, die. Daddy can, daddy can fend for himself. Did da- I'm surprised Daddy didn't go down with some sort of old-fashioned blunderbuss that it, it, he'd load. Stick. He had a sword stick which he used to keep by the door in case there was any trouble. I was like, in what world would you be able to deal with any trouble with an old-fashioned Victorian antique sword stick? <laughs> but you know, you know that thing of the rule is though is that you know people always go oh. I kept like a sword stick by the door or a gold, like a baseball bat or something like that. The law is really interesting because someone was telling me about the My security dad has a, guy. Was, a, a, one of what's it called? Mag light. Those big, oh, big torches. Yes, yeah, yeah. so that's fine. But people talk about like if if you have like a stalker fan and they, and they came into your house and you were like there and you picked up your antique sword stick that was there or your like machete and you got them with it, 
you go to prison because there is no way that you weren't planning to machete someone by having a machete by the door. So if you batter someone with like a, a, a golf club, that's likely to be by the door. A torch is likely to be by the door. An old-fashioned dueling pistol that you had <laughs> slotted by the door, you know, or a saber. You're like, how, how did you get, I cut that guy's arm off with a samurai sword? I always yeah. keep it by the door. Sir, that, I'm sorry, you're going to have to go to prison. You can go to prison. But with the dressing gown, what's the rules with the penis? Well, I mean... <laughs> Assault with a deadly weapon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, dad, obviously your dad's packing a bit of heat if they were scared yeah. by that. How is Assault your... Wait. with a very droopy weapon. <laughs> <laughs> very saggy well, weapon. Yeah, but droopy, like, you know... Yeah, got a bit like of length some hours. This is great. We've got to you know. deteriorate down to this look. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, what was I going to say? So how, how many brothers and sisters do you have? You have a sister and a brother. Is that yeah. right? And then, and and does your mum get jealous of the relationship that you had you have with your dad in the public eye because i know that if i reckon if me and my dad and this might be because i'm a daughter not a son but i reckon if me and my dad did our own shows like tv shows together i don't think my mum would like it i think she'd feel really left out how does your mum handle it well i mean i think she yeah i think she probably did feel a little bit left out oh <laughs> that's why over the course of the series she's become uh, more and more a part of it and she's very good yeah. She's yeah. uh, become a very sort of important part of that that kind of um, dynamic the, that show and that dynamic. So yeah, she's she's um she's become more involved as as the series of because got on. Because I actually messaged that you know like if I see you know I'm sort of tried to always be complimentary. Like I saw the new stuff with Jack and you know I always sort of love what he what he does and I and I'd not seen his mum before appear and there's a fantastic scene no, where haven't. she's trying to put suntan lotion on. Jack and because I mean <laughs> ordinarily you would think that you know Jack was a mature man but judging by the fact he gets his dad to fight his battles and refers to him as daddy at the <laughs> ripe old age of whatever 30 odd it is um, his mum's trying to spray it on his like get away but then she tries to spray it on her, on, her, on, her, on Jack's dad who I, I would say we spends 90% of the time in a Panama suit even on the hottest day would yeah, sit miserably under an umbrella yeah. Yeah. We, I used to have an English teacher at school like that we'd go on a tour to South Africa and we're like Mr. his name was I won't mention him Mr. H we're like do you not want to Take your shirt off, and like the, the the most relaxed he got was to undo his top button. But even then, that was for very special occasions. And the mum's like chasing around, and I just text Jack. I was like, "Your mum, your mum looks like a fucking legend. Right, okay, she well, likes I'm like gonna the funniest." Start, I'm gonna I'm gonna go back and start from that point and see. Yeah, he also is very useful in terms of getting him to be able to do more stuff. Like, yeah, the first season that we did, we had him um, a day where because as you say, he's always in that suit. We had a day where we were doing some kayaking, and I said. To get in this kayak, you're going to have to put on a um, life jacket because you can't swim. Genuinely, you can't, can't swim. swim. Can't swim. Went to a school where he's taught that by monks. Generation. Teach him with like a wooden pole prodding yeah, him. Yeah, my, my dad went to a similar sort of school where they went to swim, they just threw him in and then you just hold him down with a, with a pole and that's what? it. What? That's yeah. child abuse. Yeah. Well, it was then, but then it was called religion as well. It's called like <laughs> learning, whatever it was, yeah. Some people call it child abuse and they, other people just call it religion. It's fine. Um, so he can't swim. So I said, um, you're going to have to take your um, jacket off to put the, the life jacket on. And he was like, oh, no, no I'm not going to do that. And I was like, no, you, you, you literally have to, otherwise you will drown. And he went, I, d I don't want to be seen on screen in shirt sleeves. And we're like, what do you mean shirt sleeves? He was like, it's very unbecoming. I wear a suit. That's the way I like to present myself. And I don't want to have to wear shirt sleeves on camera. So th th that's the end of the subject. I was like, well, it's not the end of the subject because we're all here. Everyone's... You know, you've agreed Ready. to go kayaking. It's ridiculous that you're not going to kayak because you don't want to take off your jacket. And we had to get the producer to come and talk to him, the director to come and talk to him. We had to FaceTime my mum in England who had to talk him round. Eventually, he conceded that he was going to take his jacket off for this one scene if he was going to be shot in, like, a long shot out of focus for the whole scene. <laughs> and we managed to somehow cajole him into taking his jacket off. Cut to season four. I had him in drag in Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen it. it. He looks amazing. But that's like testament to a how much I've broken him down over the years. But also, absolutely no way I would have been able to get him to do that unless my mum was there. Like my yeah. mum is like the the Michael Whisperer and is able to somehow manage to to get him bring to him round. Did, that's how sort... I like to imagine I am for you. This is very true. <laughs> is, is your, is your mum sort of the, the the voice of reason? Do you do you do you actually fight the two of you, or are you um you and your dad, or or because can I imagine you're 
because you're sort of the, the funny and he's kind of the the foil to your sort of saber like, you know i mean i remember saying to you when you walked and hit that cowboy on the bump you know obviously there's parts of america where that is just like you're lucky you didn't get shot yeah um you know yeah. Did, does your mum have to talk your dad off the roof and separate you two or are you or is it normally quite amicable um i'd say with with me and my mum and my dad it's like a normally a two-pronged attack when we're trying to convince him to do something and that something is that will not be unbecoming but will be great entertainment so we take a two-pronged approach and i'll maybe like loosen him up a little bit and then she'll put in the ask and then i'll kind of neg him a bit and and we'll eventually try and find a way to convince him to do all manner of humiliating and ridiculous things for the viewers has he, has he ever thought about dynamic. has he ever thought about quitting have you ever nearly pushed him to quit like he's he's, he's stormed off while you're filming uh, he calls days sometimes. It's, you know what it's actually amazing I did a series of um, uh, a League of Their Own road trip recently which I hadn't done for a while and I went back and uh, it was so much fun and doing it with Freddie and Jamie and all those lads but um, the hours are just like normal shooting hours that you would normally shoot and and they were asking me about the difference between that and Charles and my father <laughs> it's like the reality is, and I, and I really take it for granted, doing the shooting schedule for an 80-year-old man is a really nice way to work. Like, you have a late start, you have to break for lunch at one o'clock every day without fail. He literally has to break for lunch every day at one o'clock, and he has to have a glass of wine, and he will not function unless he's had a glass of wine for lunch and an hour's lunch break in the middle of the day when lunch should be served won't have lunch early won't break for lunch late has to be at one o'clock and he needs to be done by five o'clock most days so you shoot the most incredible days and everyone on the crew loves it and loves him weirdly because he's making them work <laughs> like the civilized it. hours yeah the, the, is, that his, hours. Is, is his wine the only sort of real diva moment that he has or does he demand other things sort of like you know he needs like at least seven suits pressed at one time a panama hat holder <laughs> a cravat folder like I, I imagine there's some sort of like rider requirements for your old man oh the rider is ridiculous the wardrobe department is extensive um the wine as well has to be of a certain quality so the wine can't be just like bought from wherever the places that we've stopped in like romania the wine has to be transported with what wine does he drink oil. um he would like you know i it would have to be you know a high quality um french wine nothing yeah world or fancy or from a box i tried to get him to drink from a goon sack in australia that did not go well <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah i mean there are a lot of stipulations there's a lot of diva moments but it's great again you're 80 you can sort of you know hide behind that really yeah you just demand whatever you want and it's like well i'm 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 old now and so you you know it's not me being a diva it's just me you know it's just me being oh it's so true because like we always say our parents they're so stuck in their ways they're so stubborn my dad's the same like although i have actually managed i did manage uh last summer in france to get him onto the the box wine because let's be honest the box rosé in in the south of france is as good as the rosé you're going to get anywhere in the world but he um he's the same it has to be sauvignon it has to be from france it he does not drink any new wild wine at all and usually he gives himself permission to start drinking at lunchtime and that's his thing like and has always been his thing ever since he was like doing live tv like way back when and your dad's the same like especially with his breakfast it has to be a full english the tomatoes have to be like this not like this like it's such a like all old generation UK can get away with fucking murder. My dad takes it a sort not of step. He's not drinking at breakfast, is he? Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, or, yeah. Well, he takes it a step further. So, so instead of having like wine at lunchtime, he's like, wow, you know, champagne and orange juice for breakfast. Obviously, mid morning gin and tonic. Wine at lunch, of course. You know, <laughs> afternoon beer, evening more wine, finished with uh, a Yeah, he's got a sort of a, it's an extensive schedule of no, alcohol. Your dad doesn't start drinking at breakfast. No, he doesn't start giving breakfast. But if, you know, if, if he was, those are the order of drinks he would have. He's very specific. Well, well, my dad used to be an agent and, and was an agent in the 70s and 80s. And he looks after a lot of those like, you know, old knights and uh, people like David Hemmings. Uh, wow. Like a lot of uh, Kenny Moore was his like from Reach to for the Sky was like yeah, one of his so big, cool. big clients. Amazing actors, very old school and all like big boozes. It was a huge like drinking culture and a drinking working culture. You'd have a short, at, at, you know, just before lunch at around, you know, 11, 30, 12 o'clock at the garage. Sherry, pre-sherry. Yeah. Pre yeah. Yeah. You'd have, yeah, you would have, you'd have a full like, you know, uh, three course meal for lunch, a working lunch and then some drinks and then, yeah. you know, and he said that that was like, it was like, you'd go back to the office in the afternoon. You'd be absolutely pissed. 
Kenny Moore, who was his best friend um, and an actor who sadly passed away far too soon, probably partly because he had this lifestyle every day, but an amazing man. I, I, when he was out for dinner, and it's a, a phrase that my dad uses as well, if a waiter offers him um, water, he always goes, oh, no, thank you, darling. Water's for washing. Um, yeah, <laughs> brilliant. Oh, my day. dad's the same. Why do they not drink water? Will not drink no, water. No, my parents water. drink water. Will not drink water. Will not drink water. And in fact, I tell a story in my stand-up show, which is a true story that happened when we were filming Travels with My Father in Chernobyl, where he wouldn't drink any water um, and he was severely dehydrated. Yeah. Uh, it was a very hot day. We were in Chernobyl, which is a very sketchy place to be. There are not many facilities there. And, you know, I won't go into the whole story because it's about a five-minute anecdote in my stand-up show, but it ends up with my dad shitting himself in the woods in Chernobyl because he hasn't had a drink of water and he's hugely dehydrated. And it's Chernobyl as well. Everything's radioactive. You can't touch anything. So I yeah. had to hold his hands. Shut up. Fuck Literally me. had to prop him up while he was while shitting. While he sat in the woods. Wait, I mean, it's pretty much like, you know, because I think there must be something with, with you know, working with that. Like, you must love it. Like, the fact that a lot of people don't get to spend as much time with their parents and how fun. They're only here for, you know, a short time and, and, and normally the order of things. But even those moments... Very you, stressful as yeah, well. Yeah. I don't think I could work with my parents. I think I'd really stress, stress out. Yeah, that, that is quite stressful when you feel like you maybe have pushed them too far and they didn't want to finish a novel in the first place. And they and, and now you're holding your hands and they're shitting the woods. You're cradling them in your arms. Oh! oh trying to not look into his eyes as he shits himself oh. in the woods. At that point, you go, maybe I've pushed... Um, maybe my, I pushed my elderly 80-year-old father just a step too far. But it was his own fault for not drinking water. Yeah, it, but, yeah but I didn't want to say that at the time. I didn't Wasted. think it was an opportune moment to go, well, you know, if you drank your water, it's not just for washing, is it? It's for <laughs> hydration as well. But the best bit is... You Basic just... human biology, Dad. My dad had some really bad issues sleeping. And I asked him if he was hydrating before before bed. And he was like, no, but if you think I should, I will. And I got him and he's, his sleep patterns just completely sorted out. He started to feel miles better. And now I'm so proud of him. He makes sure that he drink, he basically drinks like a litre of water kind of between bedtime and dinner. And it's like, this is they have to have traumatic experiences to learn, Jack. He does that, he drinks now. And again, because my mum's there, she's like, drink, you will drink the water. My mum's exactly the same with yeah. my dad. But I, I love that the fact that uh, it was so traumatic and so emotional that you decided to put it in your stand-up and tell um, the entire world about it, which is, which is, I imagine he would... Did they ever just speak to you and go, Jack? Because like, a lot of people, my, my, my parents watch like Couples Quarantine or watch other bits and pieces. They read the articles that come off the back of it. Ugh. And they're like... I can't believe you did this, James. You didn't really do that. Did you? That didn't happen. I'm like, no, no mum, listen, it doesn't matter. Do they ever just turn around and say, Jack, I wish you would just fucking keep it, you know, tr treat us like you treat your missus? No, they're, they're, they're kind of amazing about it. They always have been. And right from the get-go, like all of my early stand-up shows, you know, he that's why I ended up working with my dad because he was this constant character throughout all of my early tours and all of my early stand-up. And I said so many stories about him and so, I was so indiscreet. And he's never once complained or never once said, oh, please, can you not say that? I think he's just, you know. Good for him. I'll take a note out of, out of uh, Jack's dad, but I throw you under the bus all the time when I do in podcasts. I did stuff. always wonder, like, so when I go see, like, like especially Russell Kane, who's, who's another friend of ours, when we go see his show, and obviously so much of his routine is about his missus and how she gets drunk and, like, embarrasses him and, like, what a fucking mm. nightmare she is. By the way, she sounds epic. I'm gagging to meet her. Yeah, she sounds um, But But, and I always wonder, like, I don't know whether it's the parents or the girlfriend or whoever, the brother, the sister, like... I, there are so many people who would really struggle to be okay with that. So, like, kudos to your parents for being like, you know what, you're doing a really good job. We're really proud of you. We don't mind. Keep going. Like, kudos to them. Well, they are, no, and, uh, they are they're very good and they're very um, patient with it all. In fact, I, was, I mentioned it obviously on this that thing about my uh, sister's fiance and on the Jonathan Ross show, they asked me about her wedding, and I said the story that, about my dad's father of the bride speech, in which he did. 
refer to him as a like reformed chagger uh, <laughs> in front of everyone at the wedding, which was hilarious and awful and awkward and just beat Michael Whitehall. But after this show aired, I suddenly got a pang of guilt. I was like, oh God, I've mentioned Toby by name and he might not want that out in the world and Molly might not want that out in the world. So I, 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 I'll call her. And I, I was actually quite nervous as to how she would like respond to it. So I called her up. I was like, by the way, I've, I, I just did the Jonathan Ross show. I did, I did make a joke about um toby being you know a shagger before we met you is, is that is that going to be all right and she just went you know what jack if the cap fits <laughs> <laughs> i love that i love that mate well listen i know you're you're, you're gonna, we'll let you go in a second i just got one more question because you, you talked upon um one of your sort of uh, early sort of dating stories in in the public eye is there anything else that you've had sort of like that like a really embarrassing moment because i imagine trying to you know filter out the stalkers from the the normal people has there been any kind of wild moments because you said when someone joined you for dinner i wondered if there's any sort of crazy stories that you could share with couples quarantine about some mad dating especially with someone with a profile um I mean, my worst, I think one of the worst dates I ever went on was the worst, the first date I had back after I'd broken up with my um, long-term, my last long-term girlfriend, uh, Gemma, and I went for my first date back in the game. So I was always a bit nervous. I was like, I've forgotten how to do this. And, you know, I, I just was not match fit. And, and I and I, and yeah. I took a, a, a date to this quite fancy restaurant, went in there, um, I was in the middle of the room, very lit, and I was on the table in the middle, which I don't like. Um, I, I like being in the corner, away from everyone. I don't like being the centre of attention. I like a restaurant to be dark, little booths. I had not checked it out, and I was in the middle. It was like, yeah, it was like doing a show in the round, everyone looking at me. I was very conscious. It was clearly a date as well, which made that even more awkward. Everyone was like, oh, look, there's Jack Whitehall on a date. Um, so I'm there having the dinner, and... I ordered um, a, a, a bottle of red wine. I got completely upsold on this bottle of red wine. I don't know that much about wine. The guy said, I, I said, I like, um, you know, uh, th this is the type of wine that I like. Can you recommend something? He recommended like, you know, the 500 pound bottle. And, and also, he did, did he do it in front of the woman so she can yeah. see that you, that, uh, what the price was? So if you went, well, actually, no, I'll go. She knows you're a cheapskate. Yeah, no, yeah, we exactly. We don't think like that, Fucking guys. baby, you do, you see. Not, no, I honestly, not, I... I my head. Yeah, I was like, going through my head. I'll have whatever tastes like the house red because I've had this thing called house red before and it tastes really nice. So something similar to a house red, and he yeah. went five hundred pound bottle would be great. It's like okay, yeah, we'll have that. <laughs> Drank it, you know, horrible, thin, sedimenty, not my bag at all. But I was like, well, I'll pay for the five hundred pound wine. I'm going to drink the five hundred pound wine. Um, I then uh, ordered the, uh, the starter, which was. Um, uh, a sizzling hot plate with tataki on it because that sounded kind of like a little bit of theatre, quite nice. Um, uh, that arrived obviously very loud. Everyone's now looking at me because <laughs> hot plate going down on the table. I was like, I've not thought this through. The waiter puts down the sizzling hot plate of tataki. He goes to get the beef. He turns around and the, smashes the bottle of wine, the 500 pound bottle of wine, onto the sizzling hot plate. It smashes. <laughs> then sizzles up into my face, boiling hot wine, but in my eyes, I scream because it's hot and it's red wine. So I go, ah, like that, as it's spraying on me, white shirt, completely covered in red wine. Everyone in the restaurant is now looking at me, like awful, horrific. He's trying to like pat me down. I'm like, no, 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 it's fine. He's like, can I get you another bottle of wine? I was like, I didn't like the wine anyway. It's absolutely fine. I don't want to make a scene, even though I have very much made a scene now. She's looking like horrified. She goes off to the toilet, like I get the bill we're leaving i realized on the bill he hasn't taken off like like the everything's on it like everything's on it hadn't taken off like the wine hadn't taken off the service she i was like i don't that. like complaining but on this occasion i think i'm gonna have to complain obviously i'm not gonna do it in front of her because I, that would be awful and awkward and horrific and i don't want her to see me complaining but she's gone to the loo so while she's in the loo i'll have a quick cheeky look about it i just in the future and this is just me like you know giving a little bit of feedback if you um assault someone with um <laughs> wine in their face i think i would probably take that off the bill or maybe drop the service and she was like oh god i'm so sorry that should have happened please let me take it off your card i was like no no, no i wasn't saying that i don't want to pay i'm happy to pay for the whole thing she's like give me your card literally having like a tug of war with the card 
hell, like this red faced lunatic trying to drag. And I just ran out the restaurant. I was like, come on, we're going, we're leaving. Ran out the restaurant, never saw her again. I, I, oh. Do you think being super posh is a handicap in those situations where you can't, you know, like <laughs> English people get very perturbed, but you can't, you can't say anything like, no, I, look, I, I, I'm really happy about this, but I, I you know, <laughs> you know, because it, it is sort of a handicap where you can't, you can't ever say anything. You can't go listen, actually, because I'm a real pussy like that. Where they're sort of served like there's a p- dead cockroach, a piece of glass. Oh, I'm I like, will always yeah. say something. Yeah. Also, can I just say, guys, for anyone who's listening to this, I know we have a lot of male listeners. We do not give a shit if you're like, actually, that's a bit expensive. I'm looking yeah. for something around the region of fifty quid, which, by the way, is expensive enough. And also, like, I'm always like, this wasn't cooked right. Send it back. Yeah. Either that, or I'm not paying for it. Like, it's one well, or I'm, the other. My, my thing's still clucking. HD as well. Like, <laughs> as I'm walking out of the restaurant and I'm in a white shirt, as I said, completely covered in red <laughs> and I have first degree burns on my face. And she goes, How was your evening? How do you think it went? <laughs> Look at me. Look at me. I can't open one of my eyes. Oh my god! I, I love, love it. Well, I love it. Well, listen, ladies and gentlemen, that's been Jack Whitehall uh, on Couples Quarantine. Jack, thank you so much for for coming on um, yes, thank and you. for sharing the stories business. about your family. Uh, well, hopefully, we didn't incriminate you too much. Jack, where can people find out what you're doing I, at the moment? Uh, yeah, at Jack Whitehall is my Instagram handle. Uh, if you want to find out more information on that, at Food Slut is my little food blog, and at Twitter if you want to troll me. No. Yes, yes. Ain't it, ain't he's one of them to put his head in the blender. And I thought that AXA healthcare thing was great. And next time, maybe we'll do something together, being healthy and not so healthy. Yeah, if yeah. you're interested. <laughs> Just putting out. Gagging in on everything. Gagging in on everything. time, um, how can James Haskell get the most out of this situation? Yeah. That's his MO. Yeah. I'm shallow, but I'm honest about it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, please like, please share, please subscribe uh, podcast. I'm James Haskell. I'm Chloe. This is Couples Quarantine, and we will catch you very soon. Bye, guys.